Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. Until the left-right debate becomes one of policy and not facts. Political division at the state capitol stops progress. It's really bad economics as it turns out. Trump's tariffs and the strain on Louisiana industry. We found a lot of penguins uh, where we didn't know there would, would be a lot. A big discovery and how it happened. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those stories in a moment. But right now on SWI, the state we're in, this week's headlines. The Army Corps of Engineers opened the Bonnie Carey Spillway Thursday to divert high water from the Mississippi River into Lake Pontchartrain. The 87-year-old structure is expected to remain open for two to four weeks. Corps officials say the diversion relieves pressure on local levees, lowers river stages, and reduces the speed of the river current from the spillway southward. The rising Mississippi has prompted the Corps to stop work on the replacement of a 500-foot-long flood wall at the edge of the French Quarter in New Orleans. The Corps says the work stops when the river reaches 15 feet on the Carrollton Gauge. The opening of the Bonnie Carey is not expected to keep the river below the 15-foot mark for now. There's a lawsuit in the aftermath of this video recorded arrest of a teacher during a Vermilion Parish School Board meeting January 8th. Attorney General Jeff Landry filed the suit, accusing the board of violating the state's open meetings law. The video shows how a city marshal handcuffed Daisha Hargrave after she criticized the district superintendent's pay raise. The lawsuit wants the court to nullify all board action at that meeting, including its vote for the pay raise. It also seeks civil penalties against board members. Governor John Bell Edwards and Commissioner of Agriculture Mike Strain sent a letter to congressional leaders asking they fix a provision in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. They say the provision in question penalizes instead of helps many local and family-owned agriculture businesses, in some cases costing jobs. Former LSU running back Darius Geist says he was thrown a curve during interviews with some NFL teams when they asked inappropriate questions, including about his sexuality. Such questions go against ethical and legal standards, but the league has a history of asking them and not punishing those who ask. Geis is projected as a first-round pick in next month's NFL draft. Is Louisiana headed off the cliff, the fiscal cliff that is? Lawmakers were called into special session and they failed to renew or find new sources for a billion dollars in temporary taxes set to expire at the end of June. That means legislators will have to build a spending plan now for the budget period that starts on July 1st with huge cuts to health care, the top scholarship and other state services. LPB's Kelly Spires was at the Capitol this week as the session came to a close. Lawmakers were called into special session to shore up a billion dollar hole in the budget. A breakdown in communication and a lack of trust among members of opposing political parties caused the gridlock. Representative Cameron Henry, who leads the committee that builds the budget, said the governor should have had a better handle on how members of his own party were going to vote. Clearly that was not the case. Uh, he was able to unite everyone in bipartisan opposition to just about everything that came on the floor. One critical tax bill failed by just three votes. Four votes were cast against it by members of the Black Caucus. Edward says he sought compromise. As governor, I pushed the Republicans from right to left and the Democrats left to right so that we can fashion a compromise in the middle. That is not always easy. And, and when I do that, uh, there are some times when there is tension between myself and individual members regardless of party. 
As the regular session starts, Henry's committee will be in the spotlight as they assemble a spending plan with a billion dollars worth of cuts. From Henry's point of view, the budget isn't in that bad of shape. A standstill budget for this year, for this year would be $9.4 billion. If we were to raise all the money that the governor wants to raise, that would increase the budget to $9.6 billion of state general fund. So we're a little off on those numbers, the governor is. Uh, so we'll have to kind of figure out where he's coming up with his idea of a standstill. Uh, and maybe he has a different definition of the same amount of money as last year. And that's the kind of disagreement that will make compromise difficult in the coming weeks, according to Representative Julie Stokes, a Republican from Kenner. Half of the legislature going out telling half of the people of this state that we're wasting money and that there is no fiscal cliff. And you've got the other half of this legislature going around telling the other half of the state that your futures are at stake because we've cut so deeply. And until the left-right debate becomes one of policy and not facts that are so disparate that the public can't wade through it, we never solve the problem. We're here now with a group of reporters from the Capitol to help us sort out what the dramatic conclusion of this session means for the regular session starting next week. Julia O'Donohue with the Times-Picayune, NOLA.com. Also Greg Hilben with USA Today Network and Sarah Gamard with LSU's Manship News Service. And of course, our own Kelly Spires. Kelly. Thank you, Andre. So to get started, we should talk about what kind of challenges lawmakers are facing in the regular session. Greg, um, what do you think the budget process will look like? Well, the first thing that lawmakers will have to do is assume, because <clears throat> they can't legally otherwise, begin building this budget with uh, what, they, what they term as the shortfall, which is $994 million, almost a billion dollars, they know that it will be at least $300 million less because of changes to the federal tax system, but they can't really factor that in until it's recognized by the Revenue Estimating uh, Conference. So they're going to have to build some cuts, some deep, you know, painful cuts into this budget. And the Revenue Estimating Conference is a small group of legislative leaders and economists and the Commissioner of Administration that sets um, how much the state can spend. Exactly, and how much the revenue the state will, will take in in the coming year, their estimate on it. Right. I'm curious if, one, you guys are surprised that nothing got done in this special session. But as I go out about in the community, people are talking about it at Albertsons. People, uh, workers are coming up to me and asking me, just like shaking their heads, there's a lack of trust, clearly. Um, there were comments that they're wasting our money. People, some people know how much money it costs for this special, to take, uh, special session to take place. And there's just discontent all the way around. And that's the nicest word I can say about it. I don't know if I'm surprised or not. I, I think I was pretty surprised that they weren't able to get any tax bill out of the House. Um, I thought that there might be a breakdown between the Senate and the House in terms of uh, coming to an agreement. Um, but I'm a little bit surprised that they weren't able to get a tax bill out of the House and that the ultimately the thing that sort of crashed and it caused everything to crash was that there wasn't enough trust for them to agree to move two of the tax bills in in the same order. So they had kind of agreed substantively that they might get these two bills out, but they couldn't trust each other to move the one that they liked or didn't like first. There has to be trust and there has to be some compromise. but. Again, neither of those are there. Sarah, your, your viewpoint. Well, communication as well. There were two big themes this session from our perspective on Press Row, and that was, yeah, lack of trust among factions, among people in their own party, um, the administration versus the legislators. Uh, and the other theme was lack of communication. It was an astounding lack of communication uh, the entire session. Um, it, <laughs> we, I was not seeing the backroom negotiations, but after the votes, people were Tended, we tended to come expecting things to go smoothly, at least for the last day. Mm -hmm. um, and the votes were, well, the second to last day, the votes were uh, not, they didn't go through for either bill. Um, there was supposedly a deal that didn't go through. Um, and when we, we talked to lawmakers after and asked what happened, their idea of the deal was different from the other. Like the Republicans had a different deal in mind than the Democrats did versus the author of the bill versus leadership. So it was people were just in their own reality throughout the entire session. These soured relationships among lawmakers, how will that 
affect policy making in the regular session? I think at this point, especially in the House, it's going to be hard to find these kind of collegial compromises. I mean, during this session you had a member, uh, Representative Seaball, come to the speaking well and call the governor a bald-faced liar. The governor as much as called the speaker a liar on the final night of the session after they tapped out two days early. And one member said, you know, we've lost our way. And so it's hard to build coalitions, especially for two-thirds, 70 votes, uh, with that kind of acrimony within the House. Let alone 53 votes. We were talking to Representative Barry Ivey, who's a Republican, uh, I want to say two days ago. It was the last day of the special session that morning. We were talking to Representative Barry Ivey about what he thought was going to happen. And he's already, he's already in the camp of people that think that um, you know, partisanship has been so inflamed and the body has become so exacerbated with it that they're going to, like a June special session will not be enough. There's going to be a third one, that's what he thinks. So there's already lawmakers who are predicting a third special session after this one. I think Sarah and Greg are right that the communication was really lacking and it's been lacking since 2016. They've never communicated well in the House. Um, perhaps it's not fair to compare leadership to President Alario, who's been around for 40 years, but you can see a difference between the Senate and the House and the Senate. Everyone goes in and knows, you know, what the game plan is. Whether they're going to vote or not for the game plan is is really up to them, but they they know what they what 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 people are going to expect. A lot of the um, rank and file members who I would call swing votes, those Republicans who are going to vote for taxes, um, were just not communicated with. They, they didn't know what was being talked about behind closed doors. And certainly the Black Caucus was not communicated with, I, I would say by the leadership, or really the governor didn't necessarily have a good grasp on what they were willing to do and they are needed to pass any tax. So when you go into session and you haven't really uh, got a good grasp on what they're willing to tolerate, then everything's gonna collapse. These are not, this is not the first time at the rodeo for these people, so they know what to do. And I call them these people, it's true. It's uh, across the board, uh, Democrat, Republican, independent, everybody, everybody's at fault. And everybody knows what it takes to make things happen. So just do it, enough already, right? Well, we got, the, I think part of the issue is that this, remember this is, this is brand new territory uh, still, two years in, for the House of Representatives or any chamber at the Louisiana State Capitol because this, remember, is an independent House that's still trying to find its footing. And the governor did not pick this speaker, as, as, has, as have governors in the past. And sometimes with newfound independence, you, it, takes a, it takes a while to find your footing, to find your way. And uh, not that it's a bad, that independence is a bad thing, but it's certainly different. I still think there's, 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 they're trying to find their way. Greg, you had predicted uh, that the special session, if it happened, would not be successful and that it would be, if something was decided, it would happen at the very end of the cliff, right, when you were staring over the edge of it. We had talked a couple of we, months ago. We did, and uh, we were all talking this morning that it, it seems as if you have to have, you have to be staring down that barrel uh, to, to, to get things done. And they knew they had, you know, a fallback position, though I wouldn't want to fall back yeah. that close to where I was about to fall off, but that's, that's what's happened now. All right. So we were in this special session because in even numbered years, you can't take up, lawmakers can't take up fiscal issues during a regular. So what other topics that lawmakers will be making policy decisions on will the three of you be following over the coming weeks? Um, gambling is supposed to be a big topic. Uh, there's apparently going to be legislation to move uh, casinos on land mm -hmm. officially. Um, I, I'm sure most people in the state know that they kind of technically have to be on water, but they, a lot of them are not really on water. They're kind of on a landing that's out over some water. Um, I also think there's going to be a run at um, undoing, well, tweaking, but also undoing some of the criminal justice stuff that um, came up last year. I think that the DAs are going to back some bills. I don't know with the House and the position it's in what, what exactly is going to happen there. Um, we do have some very conservative Republicans who, who are fans of that package, so it's not necessarily just a Republican-Democrat issue. Anything else that jumps out quickly? I think 
of the governor will make another run at an equal pay bill for women and uh, raising the minimum wage, neither of which I expect to pass, but uh, you know, I, I do think they'll make another run at it. Uh, and then there'll be a couple of bills about uh, to try to tweak or ban assault rifles, uh, assault weapons in the wake of the Florida tragedy, which also even the author or the potential author, he hadn't, he hadn't filed a bill as of yet, but as a state, former state police colonel, uh, said that he does not expect it to pass, but he at least wants to see where people stand. All right, I want to thank you all for being with us. I know we'll talk again. Uh, there'll be a lot, well, I'd like to say there's a lot to talk about, but it might be more of the same. We'll find out, though. Thank you so much. And a reminder to everyone, on Monday, join LPB Live for the governor's opening address of the regular session. We'll have analysis to help put everything in perspective, we hope. And join us here next week for continuing coverage from the Capitol. And the failure of lawmakers to act during this session has raised alarms about the state's credit rating. The rating impacts how we're able to borrow money to pay for things like road construction, for example. S&P Global, one of three major rating agencies, announced Wednesday the legislative gridlock is a credit weakness but did not officially yet downgrade Louisiana's rating. The state's agriculture and industrial sectors have a lot to lose from tariffs on steel imposed Thursday by President Donald Trump. Earlier in the week, Louisiana Congressman Mike Johnson and 106 House Republicans, they signed a letter to Trump urging him to reconsider the use of broad tariffs. Senior producer Kevin Gotro spoke with an economist to see how the tariffs could play out in Louisiana. Fulfilling one of his campaign promises, on Thursday afternoon, President Donald Trump imposed tariffs of 25 percent on steel and 10 percent on aluminum imported from foreign producers who he says have ravaged the U.S. industry with cheaper exports. There's a lot of steel intensive industries in the country and, uh, you know, when they're building some project or expanding, they want to do it at the cheapest way possible. That's just economics. Lawrence Scott is an economist and president of his own consulting firm. He says that introducing a steel tariff guarantees two economic results. So the first thing we know is that the price of everything that has steel in it is going to go up. The second thing is going to happen, and this is as predictable as the sun coming up in the east, is the other side is going to retaliate. They're going to pick out something that we produce over here, and they're going to raise tariffs on that. Analysts predict that China may target U.S. agricultural products like soybeans, which are grown on more acres than any other crop in Louisiana. One of Scott's biggest concerns, though, is how the tariff will affect the historically high levels of industrial investment planned in the state. We have about $85 billion worth of projects that are at the what we call the front-end engineering design stage in Louisiana. The cost of all those projects is now going to go up, which is going to make some of them think, should we do this or not do this? Scott says that while Louisiana companies like Bentler Steel and Bossier City New Core and Convent and Bayou Steel and Laplace will benefit from the tariffs. Overall, the economy comes out behind. There's been a number of studies that have been done that have shown that the number of jobs we would gain in steel are going to be way more than offset than the number of jobs we're going to lose in other areas, from retaliation to the fact that prices are, of steel are higher, so people are going to buy fewer of their products. It's just it's it's really bad economics, as it turns out. President George W. Bush put an import tariff on steel in 2002, which resulted in the loss of thousands of jobs. The Port of New Orleans suffered a 46 percent decline in steel imports. A recent study for the Brookings Institution ranks Louisiana as the second most impacted state by tariffs due to its large share of steel and aluminum imports. While Scott has been supportive of much of Trump's economic agenda, he says the tariff issue could be the downfall of the president and his party. This is, has the potential to start off something that is really, really bad. And of course, if that happens, it'll cost him his job because ultimately people vote their pocketbook. Okay? And if, if, if the economy's doing really bad the next round, not only will he do badly, but also the Republicans in general will do badly in the next election. For SWI, this is Kevin Gautreaux. 
The Associated Press reports that countries can negotiate to be exempted from the tariffs if they address the threat their imports impose to the U.S. Well, it's been one week since a study announced the discovery of a super colony of penguins near Antarctica. One of the researchers is Michael Polito, an assistant professor of oceanography at LSU. This expedition led the scientists to the Danger Islands, where advances in technology, the use of satellite imagery, and a drone verified the find. It's colder in this new penguin hotspot compared to other nearby areas, where Polito says climate change has caused the population to decline. The images from this discovery give a whole new slant to the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words, because in this case, the pictures show one and a half million a daily penguins. What's the most important aspect of this find? I think what's exciting about this discovery is, uh, one, we found a lot of penguins uh, where we didn't know there would, would be a lot, but actually it tends to reinforce our uh, initial idea about how penguins, and especially Adelie penguins, the species that that are on the Danger Islands are being affected by climate change. Over the last 50 years, there's been about three degrees Celsius increase in temperature, which doesn't sound like a lot, but in a place that is right around freezing for a good portion of the time of the year, a little bit more or less is the difference between things melting or things freezing. Polito says he has seen the impact of climate change with his own eyes. He made his first trip to the region 18 years ago in 2000. And at that time, there was glaciers that we'd have to walk over to get to a penguin colony that we needed to, to study. Ten years later, I'd go back to those same locations. You wouldn't have to walk over these glaciers anymore because they had receded enough that you could walk right in front of them on, on dry land. The Antarctic Peninsula is, is pretty well studied uh, as far as uh, penguins go, uh, but there still are a lot of places that, that are hard to get to, and the Danger Islands is one of those, those places. Uh, it's an area that's on the eastern side of the Antarctic Peninsula, and so it's really icy on that side because it's so close to the Weddell Sea, which is there's a lot of sea ice in that area. And so it's an area that ships only rarely get to. And so while we knew that there was penguins over there and maybe one of these islands had been visited a bit before, we really had no clue how many penguins were there uh, and nothing like uh, what we ended up finding out. The clue satellite imagery gave Polito and researchers, he's wearing the LSU cap third from the left in this photo, is about as basic a clue as you could find. It let them know penguins were there. We could tell that a lot of these islands had a lot of guano, which is basically a fancy term for penguin poop. And so that meant that there's probably a lot of penguins as well. And so that really led us in 2015 to, uh, to uh, have an expedition for about a month down to the Danger Islands to survey all of the islands. That's where the use of a drone came into play. It provided a superb picture quality of the black and white knee-high creatures. We would fly them up above the penguin colonies at, at a pretty uh, high height so that there was no disturbance to the animals. And we would just take pictures and we could program these drones so they would basically fly a very consistent pattern across the islands as if they were mowing a lawn, just taking pictures as they went. And from that we had thousands and thousands of images uh, that we could stitch together to get a panoramic image, panoramic aerial image of the entire island. The scientists also used time-lapse photography to document what the penguins were doing. In this case, how they rang in the new year, 2016, a two-day time-lapse. And here, over a number of months showing the same area, covered with snow and ice and no birds, and then as the ice melts and the penguins return as part of their breeding cycle. And what's next as Polito and the others continue to study the effects of climate change on these penguins? We want to start doing the same sorts of research on this population that's been done on populations in other parts of Antarctica. Really digging into the mechanisms of why this population seems to be doing well when populations just next door in areas where climates change much more rapidly are not doing so well. Polito says one thing this discovery is making clear, and that is the need to protect regions around the Antarctic Peninsula. Well, the Jekyll and Hyde winter that we had is largely behind us, and the weather will now gradually get warmer. It's a great time to take you to Kasachi National Forest in a Louisiana postcard. Here's SWI photographer Rex Q. Fortenberry.
forest has a footprint in seven central Louisiana parishes. Looks like a pretty cool place to go. That's our show for this week. Remember, you can watch LPB on demand on your phone or tablet with our LPB Anywhere app. The download's free from your app store. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows, as well as other Louisiana programs that you've come to enjoy over the years. And please like us on Facebook as well. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter and visit lpb.org where you can view more stories and leave us a comment. This program is available on DVD. Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation because together we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.